Hi, I'm John Atak. I'm Sam Atak. And um, we've had a question uh, through Facebook from a gentleman. He did some Dynetic Book One auditing, as it's called. And he's worried because he, he saw a video in which I talked about um, people basically being stuck in the behaviours um, that are associated with Scientology. And I wanted to pull that apart a little bit. Um, it is true that if somebody becomes involved with, with any belief system, that there'll be a, res a residue from that belief system. And what tends to happen is with Scientology, for example, um, that people don't really examine the beliefs that they took on board. Yeah. And because they haven't thought about it, they keep behaving that way. Yeah. So, um, you know, they go off and form another cult like uh, Nexium, for example, and believe that there are suppressives in the world. And what about the behaviours they teach you? Like uh, when you leave Scientology, do you continue just staring people down? It took me about six months after I left be before I got rid of the idea of confronting people. Yes. You know, which does make people feel uncomfortable and is a predatory thing to do. Um, animals mm. that eat other animals often stare at them first. Yes. Know? Um, so the point is that yes unexamined behaviours will continue but I think something may be a little bit confused here which is the idea that there'll be um, some unconscious behaviours that are going on that have been implanted by Scientology or indeed by any other belief system and it is true to say that there will be unconscious behaviours that, yeah. that come from the system so as you say you'll stare at people and you won't think about doing that. So you have to think about the behaviours you've been taught um, and think about whether you want those behaviours anymore. Yeah. But, I mean, there's a story about Hubbard that um, when Russell Miller was interviewing people, I was working with him on uh, Barefaced Messiah, biography of Hubbard, excellent biography of Hubbard. And he found a guy whose brother had been hypnotised by Hubbard when Hubbard was performing as a hypnotist in the late 1940s, in um, well, in the after the Second War in Los Angeles, and he used to go to science fiction, fiction fan clubs, um, and he would demonstrate his prowess as, as a hypnotist. And let me remind everyone that Ron Hubbard in 1951, in a book called Science of Survival, said never believe a hypnotist, and he also said that he started practicing hypnosis at the age of 16. Yeah. So uh, put those two ideas together. And he got this, this chap in this, Russell interviewed this chap's brother. And what used to happen was, I think it was three o'clock on a Friday afternoon, every Friday, this guy would go and stand on a certain street corner with no idea why he was doing it, which is an implanted suggestion. There's a, there's a, a virus that can um, attack an ant that will make it do the same thing make it go to a specific blade of grass hmm. every day so it hopefully gets eaten by a cow Aww. it's a virus yeah yeah i mean um yeah so you get up into the animal world there, there are various things um uh cats carry what's the thing that cats carry called the um oh. yeah. it they, affects business people well it 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 affects um well, it's, a, it's a commonplace disease. Many people carry it to a high proportion of people um, and it affects reaction time. Mm. Um, this is annoying. Yes. Um, it's on the tip of my nose. Um, it Basically, though, with rats, it's been shown that they'll be attracted to the smell of cat urine once they're infected with, um, with this. Yeah. So it's got nothing to do with what we're talking about. No. But I'm glad you brought ants in because it's not a virus. Kind of cool. It's not a virus. No. No. Some kind of parasite. Mm. Yeah. So anyway, Oren Hubbard was some kind of parasite. <laughs> yeah. I think we've arrived at that decision now rather firmly. Um, but he was able to implant a suggestion that would make this guy do this. Now, that's very, very rare. It, it's far more usual with um, hypnotic suggestions that they will decay. Mm. Uh, fairly rapidly, usually within a few days, um, you know, as in the effects of faith healing, 
Usually three days later, you're back in the wheelchair, I'm afraid. Not always, um, but most often. And so, Igor, there's nothing to worry about in terms of, a, as you say, a strange behaviour coming mm. out of you from this. Um, what's worth doing is having a look at whatever it was you actually did read at the time. So if you read Dianetics and Modern Science and Mental Health, it, I wouldn't inflict that on anybody. I've read it three times. Um, but to look at the maybe the Book One Auditors course, the materials for that, have a look at that, and perhaps read my paper, Never Believe a Hypnotist, which is on the channel here if you want to hear me reading it rather than going to the trouble of reading it for yourself. Um, there, there are references on the paper that's on, online, um, and it becomes very obvious. Uh, there is, it is absolutely undeniable that Ron Hubbard was for a long period of time practicing hypnosis uh, over 20 years. Um, he talks in a letter in 1949, which is on Tony Ortega's underground bunker, which is a letter to his literary agent, Forry Ackerman, 4E, as he called them, about having found a technique where you could rape women and they'd know nothing about it. Now, this was the technique that was the founding technique of mm. Dianetics. But in fact, when he was commissioned to write the book, um, he was working with a chap called Don Rogers. And there was an appendix in Dianetics written by Rogers for decades. Um, schematic of the mind. Um, and he basically, when he was commissioned to write the book, said, oh, um, deep trance hypnosis isn't very popular anymore. I have to do something else. And so the research he talks about, the 272 cases that he'd supposedly yeah. done, that's an awful lot of cases. Um, and there is no evidence that that is anything other than a fabrication. Indeed, there's a letter from a few months before this where he talks about having done 40 cases. Yeah. Um, but they would all have been done using deep trans hypnosis where you mm. implant suggestions. I mean, the US government certainly put a lot of money into trying to um, figure out how to create Manchurian candidates. Yeah, um, you know, I have the great good fortune to number among my friends, Professor Alan Shefflin, who um, co-wrote The Mind Manipulators, Optin and Shefflin, which along with Walter Bowman's Operation Mind Control, they're the first two books exposing the attempt to create a Manchurian candidate. Now, it gets a bit confusing because The Manchurian Candidate is a novel by Richard Gondon. Yeah. And it, there are two fine movies of it, one with Lawrence Harvey in, um, and um, the other with, with Denzel Washington. In. Um, and the idea is that you can get somebody so they're completely programmed and you show them a card mm. from, from a deck and they will go and kill somebody. Now, Darren Brown was able to replicate this. Mm. Um, and it, the CIA claimed that they'd failed completely in doing this, which seems reasonable to me. Mm. Darren Brown is able to control situations so that he can actually, you know, you have to have on the one end the command or suggestion, positive suggestion, or implant, to use Hubbard's other term for it. And at the other end, you have to have a, a, an environment that reinforces and gets you to behave that way. Within the environment of Scientology, Scientologists will respond in the way that's expected. When you go out into the world, that effect will diminish, it will decay. Mm. So I do believe it's very important to look at what you believed at the time and decide whether you believe it now. So, you know, I've had a good relationship with many independent Scientologists mm. over the years, though I don't advocate any of the techniques of Scientology. I have a good relationship because it's up to you what you do. And on those occasions where somebody, um, they feel that they benefited from doing something, then they benefited. It's up to mm. you to decide that. Um, but I, I would say that there's no need to be anxious that simply by um, going through what it is you believed, and you don't have to go back to whatever it was you read, um, but going back to what it was you believed, maybe take a look at Tony Ortega's Underground Bunker. I, I did 60 or 70 blogs, articles, talking a, a lot of them about 
the implanting techniques in Scientology, the way that you're um, persuaded to think in a certain way, to have a feeling of certainty mm. about Scientology, to be absolutely sure it's true and it works. And the superiority you get from being a member of Scientology. Mm. The, I mean, elitism belongs with just about every group yeah. there is. Yes. You know, being part of the in crowd, the in group. Mm. Um, in, indeed, we have the word elect, which is from, you know, there is the term electoi, which was used by Gnostics um, in the century or two after Jesus. The Gnostic groups had this notion that some of them were electoi, they, they were superior to everybody else, which is a huge mistake. Mm. Um, one of the things I like about the Dalai Lama is that he said that one day he realised he was just like everybody else. What I don't like about him is that he accepted money from $2 million from Nexium mm. and had meetings with Keith and Neri and got himself photographed with um, Osahara, the head of Um Shinrikyo and stuff like that. But heck, he's trying to keep his community going and maybe not doing good enough checks on where the money is coming from. I don't know. Um, so, for anybody in your predicament, um, don't worry about it too much. Um, the more you talk about it, the more you think about it, the more it comes to the surface, and you know, the less likely it is that there'll be any effect. I am not really, I mean, mentioned Alan Shefflin a minute ago, and Alan put forward the myth of irreversible mind control. Hmm. Um, he has the myth of the unmalleable mind, which is the idea that I can't be affected, other people are affected. And then you have the myth of irreversible mind control. It's very reversible. You have to digest the experience um, and then integrate it. And it properly integrated, even pretty nasty experiences with authoritarian groups and abusive relationships can be useful. Hmm. They can become helpful. So um, just a little bit about that, really. I mean, to test this idea, Five years ago, I implanted um, a secret word that when I say it will force you to burst into song and dance, hopefully. So if it works, then that disproves your argument. Here we go. Catawald. No, still not remembering. No, not good. Still not remembering. I paid a lot of money to, to get somebody to do that to you. Didn't you ever feel like yes. the largest what? Elizabeth in the world? Ah, um... I still want to put the mask on. Okay, get the mask. Thank he wants you. to put the mask on now. I'm sorry about this. Yes, yeah, sorry. I sort of think about Frank Frankenstein. <laughs> right. Yeah, there we are. And um, the only problem with this mask is, um, yeah, you can't see anything. Hmm. Yeah. Well, there we go. Yeah. So now we've seen the mask, and um, we've seen what what lurks behind the mask. Thank you very much yes. for spending some time with us today and um, please 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 look at other videos on the channel this is this is not Facebook this is not what happened today we have lots of videos go through the essentials have a look at how to recognize human predators that's the most important thing on the site and in terms of young people, it's the most important thing, I believe, that you can teach to somebody yes, yes. who's young. How to recognise when somebody is going to abuse you, going yes, to use you. Uh, look at the techniques of seduction and recruitment. I've spent four decades simplifying this, making it access as accessible as possible. And then the fake news section is the other thing that's... Um, very useful indeed. And if you want to know about Scientology, there's just a mountain of stuff on here. Yeah, there's some but Micrinder not. stuff. That's Micrinder good. stuff, Karen de la Carrie stuff. Hmm. Um, and the talks I gave at Toronto, what you know, talk with Steve Hassan, Christian Cherko, and Chris Shelton, who was just hmm. like a baby Chris Shelton. Oh, there. yes, he was. It's only a year <laughs> or so stage. out of, well, I don't know if he was in a larval stage. That wasn't very. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry that, Chris. <laughs> I, I, will, I, like you, I will be giving him a beating later, don't worry. Um, but yeah, I think it's Chris's first, probably first public yeah. appearance. Um, but we talked about how the techniques work in terms of control, guided imagination, hypnosis, whatever we want to call it. So that's quite good fun. Um, the Getting Clear Conference. And I'm very, very keen on Yuval Law's work because I think mm. this guy's 
absolutely the leading edge at the moment. He's doing the most exciting work there is in terms of understanding how we behave and why we become fervent about things and why we think we know stuff when there isn't actually any evidence for it. So, and why evolution is a lot more wonderful. Than yeah, the, the, the kind of Mendel Dawkins boring yeah. selfish, selfish gene stuff, stuff, which is A, unscientific and B, mm. wrong. Um, when in fact there's this wonderful thing where, where every one of us is important, yeah. you know, that we're not just little ball bearings in a machine that everything we do is important and um, so we should um, act as if what we did made a difference, as yes. William James put it, who was also the guy that pointed us towards understanding feelings of knowing, feelings of certainty, mm. more than 100 years ago. So, thank you very much indeed. I'm John Atak. I'm Sam Atak. And um, we hope to see you again extraordinarily soon. Bye-bye. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps, and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. Or you can make a one-off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much. So it's got nothing to do with what we're talking about. No.